All right, so we're going to look at Eisenhower's foreign policy. So Eisenhower was the president after Harry Truman, so it's still early part of the Cold War. But in terms of we're looking at like kind of causes here, this would be context. Things you might include in context for Eisenhower's foreign policy would be things like the Korean War, which kind of just wrapped up early on in Eisenhower's presidency. The idea of containment and that idea of uh, kind of the stopping the spread of communism with things like the Truman Doctrine, um, and things like the Marshall Plan. These are all examples of context that you would probably use to give us some idea about what was happening before Eisenhower's presidency with foreign policy. So, you know, Truman Doctrine, Marshall Plan, the Korean War, um, those kind of things uh, would be uh, appropriate context. So I have a thesis at the bottom here. It says Eisenhower's foreign policy showed restraint and involvement in large conflicts. So I use that as one of the categories here. And then this in that first sentence, so it's kind of the less important category. And however, on a smaller scale, Eisenhower's foreign policy created more enemies than friends. Here's our second category. So create more enemies and friends and raise tensions with the Soviet Union. There's our third category, or raise tensions with the Soviet Union. So this thesis is claiming that this is less important than these two are. Okay, so we're going to talk about each of these categories here. So let's start with the restraint in large conflicts. So obviously the large conflict here with the Hungarian Revolution is the Cold War. And so when the Hungarian Revolution occurred, which was happening in one of those Eastern European countries that the Soviet Union controlled, um, the, uh, you know, Eisenhower refused to really kind of engage in the, uh, uh, in directly with, with the Soviet Union and the conflict there. So, he, you know, he did uh, kind of, that could have easily escalated if you saw a chance for like democracy to spread into Hungary. If Eisenhower had gotten involved, that could have sparked a wider conflict with the Soviet Union across Eastern Europe. But Eisenhower opted to kind of stay out of it and not really do uh, too much with, uh, uh, with the Hungarian Revolution. The other one, which will have bigger consequences much later, is what's happening in Vietnam. So Vietnam was a French colony, but in 1954 at Dien Bien Phu, uh, the Vietnamese kind of rebel forces, they defeated the French um, in a kind of a big, uh, a big victory for them. And the French asked for the United States help um, to help them with this kind of colonial rebellion in uh, French Indochina or Vietnam. And Eisenhower opted to not send any troops to help France. Even though France was an ally and a NATO ally, uh, Eisenhower said, you know, we're not going to send any troops in there. He did send aid to South Vietnam, which was the non-communist uh, part of things. So this is going to have major consequences for the country later on. I mean, eventually the United States does get involved in Vietnam. So in one sense, Eisenhower was showing restraint by not sending any troops. However, we the United States has kind of dip its toe into the water here by sending some uh, kind of financial aid to South Vietnam. And that's only going to escalate as time goes on when we get to the uh, Kennedy and then the Johnson administration where it goes into the full-blown Vietnam War. All right. <clears throat> the second category is that Eisenhower created more enemies than friends. <clears throat> what, I, what this means is that, you know, in the course of doing what he thought was the correct thing to do in foreign policy, it ends up kind of backfiring, kind of hurting us in the long run. So, for example, in Cuba, you know, you have the, uh, the kind of uh, Castro kind of... Uh, um, uh, regime is trying to, or Castro is trying to rebel against the uh, Cuban uh, Cuban leadership, and so when uh, the United States has economic interests in Cuba, like sugar and tourism and that kind of thing, and so uh, the United States was kind of like uh, not in control of Cuba, but had a huge financial uh, stake in what was happening in Cuba and very friendly relations with the Cuban dictator Batista at that point. And a lot of the Cuban people felt like they were being shut out of the economy. And so Castro's revolution is partly in response to U.S. economic control of Cuba. So uh, the enemy here the United States creates is Castro. Um, so if the United States had been a little bit more uh, friendly to the Cuban people, uh, without having exerting so much economic control and letting Cuba kind of have its economic independence, would the Castro Revolution have occurred? Maybe, but uh, certainly it, it didn't uh, make Cubans feel very warmly towards the United States because of how much economic control the United States had over Cuba.
Similar sort of situation in Guatemala. In Guatemala, there was another um, government that was that was seen as kind of a dictator. That was kind of a uh, dictatorship that the United States was kind of um, friendly with. And the United Fruit Company, uh, they were saying that the this this new government in Guatemala was kind of a communist leaning government. So the uh, United States government kind of intervened. Uh, on behalf of uh, the United Fruit Company and American business interests uh, in <clears throat> in Guatemala. So this is another situation where the United States is, is kind of siding with people that maybe are not, don't have the best interests of the country at heart and is more focused on what how it benefits the United States. So again, they're not winning any friends here uh, in, in Latin America. So this is kind of a... Uh, similar to during the time of Theodore Roosevelt and uh, Taft and that kind of t time when we were involved in Latin America and it created a lot of resentment. So it's kind of returned to that idea. And then lastly is Iran, where, you know, the Middle East was an oil rich country. The United States kind of used a lot of oil from the Middle East and the United States kind of backed uh, the Shah of Iran uh, because they were afraid of <clears throat> losing oil. Um, and so they want to kind of maintain stability in the um, uh, in the Middle East. And so this idea that the United States government through the CIA helped to install and put into place the Shah of Iran and they could be a, uh, an American ally. So what we have here is in Guatemala and Iran, the United States government kind of stepping in and intervening in governments and kind of putting in new governments that are more friendly to the United States. And then Cuba is the Cuban people kind of resentful of the United States and their economic kind of imperialism of, of that time. All right, our third category is that Eisenhower actually raised tensions with the Soviet Union. So even though you should resist uh, restraint in these large conflicts, tensions increase between the United States and the Soviet Union. One of the things that happens is Eisenhower, through his Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, introduces the idea of massive retaliation, which is kind of like a, using threatening the use of nuclear weapons to deal with kind of local conflicts. This was seen as a way to kind of save some money so you weren't spending so much on defense. You can, you can say like, oh, we're not going to send troops in. We're going to send bombers with nuclear weapons. And that that threat would be enough to stop whatever the conflict is, the local conflict uh, might have been. But obviously there's a huge danger there because if one side uses nuclear weapons, so does the other. So this all kind of comes out in this idea of brinksmanship, which is you take the Soviet Union to the brink in order to get what you want out of it. So it's like going to the edge of war. So that means during this time, like the United States and the Soviet Union are constantly on this kind of this edge of war, like that a nuclear war could happen in any time. So it's part of that kind of like fear that's happening in the country uh, through the time. So you start to see people like buying bomb shelters and putting them in their backyards in case there's a nuclear war, all that kind of stuff. And this is going to come to like a climax in the Kennedy administration when we have the Cuban Missile Crisis, which we'll talk about later. And then finally, there's the U-2 spy incident where uh, this was an embarrassing thing for Eisenhower in which the U-2 is a plane, a spy plane that flies very, very high uh, up in the sky. And there was one that was flying over the Soviet Union and it was shot down. And at first the United States denied the fact that this was a spy plane. Then the Soviet Union actually produced the pictures and said, well, what were they doing taking pictures of these things? So it was very embarrassing for the United States. And so the Soviet leader, Nikita Khrushchev, uh, kind of was calling out Eisenhower and saying, like, you're, you're spying on us and that's not good. Now, of course, uh, you know, both sides are spying on each other, but you don't want to get caught spying because it becomes very embarrassing and it kind of ratchets up that tension between the two, between the two countries. Okay. So Eisenhower's foreign policy, uh, you know, has some long-term consequences in terms of our relationships with places around the world. And sometimes, and those kind of develop into some more negative relationships, you know, with Cuba and Castro, resentment in Central America, resentment in the Middle East too, because we're putting in a new government there that maybe the people don't necessarily accept. And then kind of creating this tension of the Soviet Union and making things, uh, making people feel a little more nervous about a uh, nuclear war.